Shabbat Shalom. Everybody, we're gathered together in fellowship once again on the, what is it, the 30th of October for the Gregorian calendar, and it is the 16th of the eighth month on our Creator's calendar. We are still reading the Recognitions of Clement, and we're on Book 1, Chapter 72, and this is Kepha being sent to Caesarea. This is, while therefore we abode in Jericho, or Jericho, and gave ourselves to prayer and fasting, Yaakov, the overseer, sent for me, speaking of Kepha, and sent me here to Caesarea, saying that Zakai had written to him from Caesarea, that one Shimon, a Samaritan magician, was subverting many of our people, asserting that he was the standing one, that is, in other words, the Mashiach, and the great power of El Elyon, which is superior to the creator of the world. At the same time that he showed many miracles and made some doubt, and others fall away to him. He informed me of all things that had been ascertained respecting this man from those who had formerly been either his associates or his taught ones, and had afterwards been converted by Zakai. Many, therefore, there are, O Kepha, said Jacob, for whose safety's sake it behooves you to go and to refute the magician and to teach the word of truth. Therefore, make no delay, nor let it grieve you that you set out alone, knowing that Yahuwah by Yahushua will go with you and will help you, and that soon by his favor you will have many associates and sympathizers. Now be sure that you send me in writing every year an account of your sayings and doings, and especially at the end of every seven years. With these expressions, he dismissed me, and in six days, or Yamim, I arrived at Caesarea. And if you remember, Zakai is the little tax collector that was climbing up into the tree to see our Mashiach. <clears throat> this is, when I entered the city, our most beloved brother Zakai met me, and embracing me, brought me to this lodging, in which he himself stayed inquiring of me concerning each of the brothers, especially concerning our honorable brother, Yaakov. And when I told him that he was still lame on one foot, on his immediately asking the cause of this, I related to him all that I have now detailed to you, how we had been called by the Kohanim and Kayafa, the Kohen Hagadol, to the Hekel. And how Yaakov, the overseer, standing on the top of the steps, had four seven successive days shown the whole people from the scriptures of Yahuwah that Yahushua is the Mashiach. And how when all were acquiescing that they should be immersed by him in the name of Yahushua, an enemy did all those things that I have already mentioned and that I need not repeat. And if you recall, the enemy at that time was Shaul, or what they called Paul of Tarsus. And then it showed immediately after that he was getting the letters to go to Damascus because he thought Kepha was there. And that's in the common scriptures in the book of Acts. <clears throat> when Zakai had heard these things, he told me in return of the doings of Shimon. And in the meantime, Shimon himself, how he heard of my arrival, I do not know, sent a message to me saying, let us dispute tomorrow in the hearing of the people. To which I answered, be it so as it pleases you. And this promise of mine was known over the whole city, so that even you who arrived on that very day learned that I was to hold a discussion with Shimon on the following day, and having found out my abode according to the directions that you had received from Yahusha Barnaba, came to me. 
But I so rejoiced at your coming that my mind, moved I know not how, hastened to expound all things quickly to you. Yet especially that which is the main point of our belief concerning Yahushua, which alone I doubt not is a sufficient foundation for the whole of our halakha or path. Then in the next place, I unfolded to you the more secret meaning of the written Torah through its several heads, which there was occasion to unfold. Neither did I conceal from you the tobe things of the traditions, but what remains beginning from tomorrow, you will hear from day to day in connection with the questions that will be raised in the discussion with Shimon, until by Yahuwah's favor, we reach that city of Rome to which we believe that our journey is to be directed. I then declared that I owed him all thanks for what he had told me, and promised that I would most readily do all that he commanded. Then having taken food, he ordered me to rest, and he also betook himself to rest. Continuing on, we're now on book two, and this is chapter one, The Power of Habit. <clears throat> And when the day dawned that had been fixed for the discussion with Shimon Kepha, rising at the first cock crowing, aroused us also. For we were sleeping in the same apartment, thirteen of us in all, of whom next to Kepha, Zakai was first, then Zephin Yahu, Yahusuf, and Mikael, Eli Esdras, Finhas, Elazar, and Elisha. After these, I, Clement, and Nicodemon, or Nicodemon, then Nisita and Achilla, who had formerly been taught ones of Shimon, and were converted to the belief of Mashiach under the teaching of Zakai. Of the women, there was no one present. As the evening light was still lasting, we all sat down in Kepha, seeing that we were awake and that we were giving attention to him, having saluted us, immediately began to speak as follows. I confess, brothers, that I wonder at the power of man's nature, which I see to be fit and suited to every call upon it. This, however, it occurs to me to say of what I have found by experience, that when the middle of the night is past, I awake of my own accord, and sleep does not come to me again. I have done this for this reason, that I have had for, sorry, that I have formed the habit of recalling the memory of the words of my master, which I heard from himself, and for the longing I have towards them, I constrain my mind and my thoughts to be roused, that awaking to them and recalling and arranging them one by one, I may retain them in my memory. From this, therefore, while I desire to cherish the sayings of Yahushua with all the delight of my or all delight in my heart, the habit of waking has come upon me, even if there be nothing that I desire to think of. Thus, in some uncountable way, when any custom is established, the old custom is changed, provided indeed you do not force it. Just a moment. Sorry about that. Thus, in some unaccountable way, when any custom is established, the old custom is changed, provided indeed you do not force it above measure, but as far as the measure of nature admits. For it is not possible to be altogether without sleep, Otherwise, night would not have been made for rest. Then I, when I heard this, said, You have very well said, O Kepha, for one custom is superseded by another. For when I was at sea, I was at first distressed, and all my system was disordered, so that I felt as if I had been beaten, and could not bear the tossing and tumult of the sea. 
But after a few days, when I had got accustomed to it, I began to bear it tolerably, so that I was glad to take food immediately in the morning, along with the sailors. Whereas before it was not my custom to eat anything before the seventh hour. Now, therefore, simply from the custom that I then acquired, hunger reminds me about the time at which I used to eat with the sailors, which, however, I hope to get rid of when once another custom will have been formed. I believe, therefore, that you also have acquired the habit of wakefulness, as you state, and you have wished at a fitting time to explain this to us, that we may also, or sorry, that we also may not grudge to throw off and dispense with some portion of our sleep, that we may be able to take in the precepts of the living halakha or path. For when the food is digested and the mind is under the influence of the silence of night, those things that are seasonably taught abide in it. One thing that's covered in these books I find interesting is how you can prepare yourself and your body to help your mind function better. Moderation in sleep or moderation in eating, getting adequate sleep, making sure your food is digested. All these things are important for your mind to function well and talked about in these writings too. <clears throat> Practicality. Yes, sir. Practicality for the use of your body for his purposes, right? Or as Shaul would put it, our reasonable worship. All right, chapter three, need for caution or need of caution. Then Kepha, being pleased to hear that I comprehended the purport of his preface, that he had delivered it for our advantage, and commending me, doubtless for the purpose of encouraging and stimulating me, began to deliver the following discourse. It seems to me to be seasonable and necessary to have some discussion relating to those things that are near at hand, that is, concerning Shimon, for I should desire to know of what character and of what conduct he is. Therefore, if any one of you has any knowledge of him, let him not fail to inform me, <clears throat> for it is of consequence to know these things beforehand. For if we have it in charge that when we enter into the city or a city, we should first learn who in it is worthy that we may eat with him, how much more is it proper for us to ascertain who or what sort of man he is to whom the words of immortality are to be committed? For we ought to be careful, yes, extremely careful, that we cast not our pearls before swine. But for other reasons also, it is of importance that I should have some knowledge of this man. For if I know that in those things concerning which it cannot be doubted that they are good, he is faultless and irreproachable. That is to say, if he is sober, merciful, upright, gentle, and compassionate, which no one doubts to be good qualities, then it will seem to be fitting that upon him who possesses these good virtues, that which is lacking of belief and knowledge should be conferred. Now, we were just talking about this beforehand, and it's rather fitting that we have the instructions from Kepha and exactly how this is supposed to work. So if these qualities are readily apparent, then it's obvious that they should get what's lacking of belief and knowledge in the truth. And so his life, which is in other respects worthy of approval, should be amended in those points in which it will appear to be imperfect. But if he remains wrapped up and polluted in those sins that are manifestly such, it does not become me to speak to him at all of the more secret and set apart things of L breathed knowledge, but rather to protest and confront him. One thing that we don't, well, I didn't know until recently, is that protest, like the protestants or the protestari, it's a Latin word, but it originally means to bear witness, not necessarily to 
to actively speak out against something, but it's to bear witness. <clears throat> and so when he's talking about his two witnesses, it's the, his two Protestants. That's something that most people might not be aware of. This is, but rather to protest and confront him that he cease from sin and cleanse his actions from vice. But if he insinuate himself and lead us on to speak what he, while he acts improperly, ought not to hear, it will be our part to parry him cautiously. For not to answer him at all does not seem proper for the sake of the hearers, lest they may think that we decline the contest through want of ability to answer him. And so their belief may be injured through miscomprehending of our purpose or through their miscomprehending of our purpose. When Kepha had thus spoken to us, Nasita asks permission to say something to him. And Kepha having granted permission, he says, <clears throat> with your pardon, I beseech you, my master Kepha, to hear me, who am very anxious for you, and who am afraid, least in the contest that you have in hand with Shimon, you should seem to be overmatched. For it frequently is the case that he who defends the truth does not gain the victory, since the hearers are either prejudiced or have no great interest in the better cause. But over and above all this, Shimon himself is a most feminine orator, trained in the dialectic art and in the meshes of Sigoliisms. And what is work? Now, the dialectic art is to be tricky with wordplay. Sigoliisms are those nonsense parables to try to trip someone up, like what you saw earlier, or we had read a few weeks ago when Yahusuf Barnaba was speaking to the Romans and the Greeks in Rome. And some of the philosophers there were trying to trip him up, asking him questions about the why an elephant's so big and only has four legs, but a, an insect is little and yet has six legs and wings to boot. I was just going to ask you what that word meant. <laughs> right. It's about their tricky wordplay and how they try to be clever. And in reality, they're void of the truth, which is simple and plain. I have a question. Yes, sir. So elephants don't wear boots, but insects do. I don't know what you mean with that. If I said boots, I misspoke. I'm sorry about that. I'm just teasing you. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. Sometimes my sense of humor is missing. All right, all right. Sorry to get back on track there. It says, and what is worse than all, he is greatly skilled in the magic art. And therefore, I fear, least being so strongly fortified on every side, he will be thought to be defending the truth while he is alleging falsehoods in the presence of those who do not know him. For neither should we ourselves have been able to escape from him and to be converted to Yahuwah, had it not been that while we were his assistants and the sharers of his errors, we had ascertained that he was a deceiver and a magician. And when Nasita had thus spoken, Achilla also asking that he might be permitted to speak, proceeded in the following or in the manner following. <clears throat> Receive, I entreat you, most excellent Kepha, the assurance of my love towards you, for indeed I also am extremely anxious on your account. And do not blame us in this, for indeed to be concerned for anyone comes of affection, whereas to be indifferent is no less than hatred. But I, I call... It. It's not scrolling. All right, thank you for that. Just a moment. But I call Yahuwah to witness that I feel for you, not as knowing you to be weaker in debate, 
for indeed I was never present at any dispute in which you were engaged, but because I well know the impieties of this man. I think of your reputation, and at the same time, the inner beings of the hearers, and above all, the interests of the truth itself. For this magician is vehement towards all things that he wishes, and immoral above measure. For in all things we know him well, since from boyhood we have been assistants and ministers of his immorality, and had not the love of Yahuwah rescued us from him, we should even now be engaged in the same evil deeds with him. But a certain inborn love towards Yahuwah rendered his immorality hateful to us and the worship of Yahuwah attractive to us. Whence, I think also that it was the work of Yahuwah that we, being first made his associates, should take knowledge in what manner or by what effects the prodigies that he seems to work. For who is there that would not be astonished at the wonderful things that he does? Who would not think that he was a mighty one come down from the Shemaim for the deliverance of men? For myself, I confess, if I had not known him intimately and had taken part in his doings, I would easily have been carried away with him. Whence it was no great thing for us to be separated from his society, knowing as we did that he depends upon magic arts and immoral devices. But if you also yourself wish to know all about him, who, what, and whence he is, and how he contrives what he does, then listen. Chapter 7, Simon Hamag, His History. This Shimon's father was Antonius and his mother Rachel. By tribe he is a Shomroni, or a Samaritan, from the village of Getones. By profession, <clears throat> profession, a magician, yet exceedingly well trained in the Greek literature, desirous of glory, and boasting above all the race of man, so that he wishes himself to be believed to be an exalted power, which is above Yahuwah the Creator, and to be thought to be the Mashiach, and to be called the Standing One. And he uses this name as implying that he can never be dissolved, asserting that his flesh is so compacted by the power of his mightiness that it can endure to eternity. Hence, therefore, he is called the standing one, as though he cannot fall by any corruption. For after that Yahukanon the immerser was killed, as you yourself also know. When Dositheus had broached his heresy, with 30 other chief Talmudim, or taught ones, and one woman who was called Luna. In the Syriac version, she's called Shara, and Shara is Hebrew for moon, just like Luna is, means lun, Luna, Luna is moon. It, it has to do with that name for the reasons you're about to see. But whence also these 30 appear to have been appointed with reference to the number of the Yamim or days according to the course of the moon. This Shimon, ambitious of evil esteem, as we have said, goes to Dositheus and pretending friendship entreats him that if any one of those 30 should die, he should straightway substitute him in for the dead. For it was contrary to their rule, either to exceed the fixed number, or to admit anyone who was unknown or not yet proved. Whence also the rest, desiring to become worthy of the place and number, are eager in every way to please, according to the institutions of their sect, each one of those who aspire after admittance into the number. 
hoping that he may be deemed worthy to be put into the place of the deceased, when, as we have said, anyone dies. Therefore, Dositheus, being greatly urged by this man, introduced Shimon when a vacancy occurred among the number. Shimon the magician, his profession. But not long after, oh, and just so you know, if you read what we were doing earlier, Irenaeus is against heresies, the apostolic constitutions. I believe you'd see some of this in Ignatius's epistles that he wrote while he was being taken to Rome to be fed to wild beasts, the longer versions. And then you also have Justin Martyr, perhaps. All of these are contemporaries for these times within the first 300 years. And they write about the Gnostics and these things that are coming up. So what we see here is also mentioned by these other writers and it, all of it together makes, gives us a full picture of the information they had available that we can still know at this time. But this is the most significant. This is where you get the, the meat, the meat potatoes, if you will, the, the, the most of it. And then you can see it filled out and fleshed out by the others as well. <clears throat> It says, but not long after he fell in love with that woman whom they call Luna, and he confided all things to us as his Havarim, or friends, how he was a magician, and how he loved Luna, and how being desirous of esteem, he was unwilling to enjoy her ingloriously, but that he was waiting patiently till he could enjoy her honorably, yet so if we also would conspire with him towards the accomplishment of his desires. And he promised that as a reward of this service, he would cause us to be invested with the highest honors and we should be delivered or we should be believed by men to be mighty ones. Only however, on condition said he that you confer the chief place upon me, Shimon, who by magic art am able to show many signs and prodigies, or prodigies, prodigies, sorry, <clears throat> by means of which either my esteem or our sect may be established. For I am able to render myself invisible to those who wish to lay hold of me, and again, to be visible when I am willing to be seen. If I wish to flee, I can dig through the mountains, and pass through rocks as if they were clay. If I should throw myself headlong from a lofty mountain, I should be borne unhurt to the earth, as if I were held up. When bound, I can loose myself and bind those who had bound me. Being shut up in prison, I can make the barriers open of their own accord. I can render statues animated so that those who see me suppose that they are men. I can make new trees suddenly spring up and produce sprouts at once. I can throw myself into the fire and not be burnt. I can change my countenance so that I cannot be recognized, but I can show people that I have two faces. I will change myself into a sheep or a goat I will make a beard to grow upon little boys. I will ascend by flight into the air. I will exhibit abundance of gold and will make and unmake messengers. I will be worshipped as an Eloa or mighty one. I will have divine honors publicly assigned to me so that an image of me will be set up and I will be worshipped and adored as a mighty one. And that's something that I just said, I think it was off the air, but you don't read it in this book. However, <clears throat> in the Apostolic Constitutions, you have a section in Book 7, which is called the Heresy Section, and it talks about all the different errors that were brought in since the belief was given to men, starting at the time of Moshe, and the errors that were brought in by the children in the wilderness Abraham, Datham and Abraham, Korah, with a strange fire. Just a moment, sorry about that. All right, so 
backtrack a little, I think. It says, and what, or here, I'll backtrack right here. It says, I will be worshipped as an Eloa or Elohim. I will have divine honors publicly assigned to me so that an image of me will be set up and I will be worshipped and adorned as a mighty one. And what need of more words, whatever I wish that I will be able to do for already, I have achieved many things by way of experiment. In short, says he, once when my mother, Rachel ordered me to go to the field to reap and I saw a sickle lying, I ordered it to go and reap and it reaped 10 times more than the others. Lately, I produced many new sprouts from the earth and made them bear leaves and produce fruit in a moment. And the nearest mountain I successfully bored through. But when he spoke thus of the production of sprouts and the perforation of the mountain, I was confounded on this account because he desired or wished to deceive even us in whom he seemed to place confidence. For we knew that those things had been from the days of our fathers, which he represented as having been done by himself lately. We then, although we heard these atrocities from him, and worse than these, yet we followed up his crimes and suffered others to be deceived by him, telling also many lies on his behalf. And this before he did any of the things that he had promised, so that while as yet he had done nothing, he was by some thought to be Elohim, or Mighty One. Meantime, at the outset, as soon as he was reckoned among the 30 taught ones of Dositheus, or Dositheus, he began to deprecate Dositheus himself, saying that he did not teach purely or perfectly. And that this was the result not of ill intention, but of ignorance. But Dositheus, when he had perceived that Shimon was deprecating him, fearing least his reputation among men might be obscured, for he himself was supposed to be the standing one, moved with rage, when they met as usual at the school, seized a rod and began to beat Shimon. But suddenly the rod seemed to pass through his body, as if it had been smoke. On this, Dositheus being astonished, says to him, Tell me, if you are the standing one, that I may adore you. And when Shimon answered that he was, then Dositheus, perceiving that he himself was not the standing one, fell down and worshipped him, and gave up his own place as chief to Shimon, ordering all the rank of thirty men to obey him himself taking the inferior place that Shimon formerly occupied. Not long after this, he died. Therefore, after the death of Dositheus, Shimon took Luna to himself, and with her he still goes about, as you see, deceiving multitudes and asserting that he himself is a certain power that is above Yahuwah, the Creator, while Luna, who is with him, has been brought down from the higher Shamayim, and that she is Chokmah, or wisdom, the mother of all things. For whom, says he, the Greeks and barbarians contending, were able in some measure to see an image of her, what they call Sophia, which is the Greek word for wisdom, but also the personification of it as a female to them, but of herself as she is, as the dweller with the first and only L, they were wholly ignorant. Propounding these and other things of the same sort, he has deceived many. But I ought also to state this, which I remember that I myself saw. Once in this Luna of his was, sorry, once when this Luna of his was in a certain tower, a great multitude has had assembled to see her and was standing round the tower on all sides. But she was seen by all the people to lean forward 
and to look out through all the windows of that tower. Many other wonderful things he did and does, so that men, being astonished at them, think that he himself is the El Elyon, or Most High. Now when Nisita and I once asked him to explain to us how these things could be affected by magic art, and what was the nature of it, Shimon began thus to explain it to us as his associates. I have, said he, made the spirit of a boy pure and violently slain, and invoked by unspeakable commands to assist me, and by it all is done that I command. Now, I don't want to focus on this part too much, but I do want to say that this very thing, the idea of using a young boy, especially a, a young virgin boy, in rituals for power, is something that is even mentioned today that, that these practitioners do. There's a gentleman who was in the FBI named Ted Gunderson, and he's a retired agent some 20 or so years ago. He came out along with that Kathy O'Brien and her handler, as well as some other actual victims that were not being controlled. And they were talking about the different things that were going on with MK Ultra and the, the satanic ritual abuse and other things that are very unpleasant. But he mentioned himself that they use little boys for power. In particular, that's the most powerful that they can get. It's also mentioned, I believe, by John Todd. <clears throat> Right here it says, but said I, is it possible for the spirit or the Ruach of man to do these things? He answered, I would have you know this, that the Ruach or spirit of man holds the next place after Elohim when once it is set free from the darkness of his body. And immediately it acquires insight. So it is invoked for, me for necromancy. Then I answer, why then do not the Ruach Oath or spirits of persons who are slain take vengeance on their slayers? Do you not remember, said he, that I told you that when it goes out of the body, it acquires knowledge of the future? I remember, said I. Well then, said he. As soon as it goes out of the body, it immediately knows that there is a judgment to come and that everyone will suffer punishment for those evils that he has done. And therefore, they are unwilling to take vengeance on their slayers because they themselves are enduring torments for their own evil deeds that they had done here. And they know that severer punishments await them in the judgment. Moreover, they are not permitted by the messengers who preside over them to go out or to do anything. Now, I, I, he, Kepha points out the hypocrisy and the inconsistencies and things of his statements later on. But I, I want to point this one out because it's not. He just said that the spirit of a man has the next place of Elohim outside the body. But then he says that messengers don't permit them things, meaning that these are more powerful. So there's already inconsistency with his logic. And that's something that Satan is the father of lies and his children emulate him. So the, the pattern that you'll find is that they hold to things that just aren't true. Right. <clears throat> this is then I replied. If the messengers do not permit them to come here or to do what they please, how can the spirits obey the magician who invokes them? It is not, said he, that they grant indulgence to the spirits that are unwilling to come. But when the presiding messengers are adjured by one greater than themselves, they have the excuse of our violence who adjure them to permit the Ruach Oath, it's most likely the inner beings, the Nefeshot, right? 
the inner beings that we invoke to go out. For they do not sin who suffer violence, but we who impose necessity upon them. Thereupon Nisita, not able longer to refrain, hastily answered, as indeed I also was about to do, only I desired first to get information from him on several points. But as I said, Nisita, anticipating me, said, and do you not fear the yom of judgment, who do violence to messengers and invoke inner beings and deceive men and bargain for divine honor to yourself from them? And how do you persuade us that there will be no judgment as some of the Yahudim profess and that inner beings are not immortal as many suppose, though you see them with your very eyes and receive from them the assurance of Elohim's judgment. At those sayings of his, Shimon grew pale, but after a little recollecting himself, he thus answered, and this is the peculiar thing about immorality. It's also clearly said in the apostolic constitutions that they're incapable of perceiving the truth because of their voluntary wickedness or inequity. And it's the same thing here because of his voluntary inequity. While he knows there's a judgment to come and he sees these things and it's spoken to him by these demons, he cannot get it through his mind that he's under judgment and that he himself is going to be suffering these things because he's his senses are diluted by Satan or demonic influence. But he thus answered, do not think that I am a man of your race. I am neither a magician nor lover of Luna nor son of Antonius. For before my mother Rachel had and he came together, she still a virgin conceived me. While it was in my power to be either small or great, and to appear as a man among men. Therefore, I have chosen you first as my friends for the purpose of trying you, that I may place you first in my Shemaim and unspeakable places when I will have proved you. Therefore, I have pretended to be a man so that I might more clearly ascertain if you cherish entire affection towards me. But when I heard that, judging him indeed to be a wretch, yet wondering at his impudence and blushing for him, and at the same time fearing lest he should attempt some evil against us, I beckoned to Nisita to feign for a little along with me, and said to him, Be not angry with us, corruptible men, you incorruptible mighty one, but rather accept our affection and our mind willing to know who Elohim is. For we did not know till now, sorry, for we did not till now know who you are, nor did we perceive that you are he whom we were seeking. Shimon the magician professed to have been made a boy there. This is probably where we'll stop here. <clears throat> It says, as we spoke these and such like words with looks suited to the occasion, this most vain fellow believed that we were deceived. And being thereby the more elated, he added this also, or he added also this. I will now be encouraging to you for the affection that you bear towards me as Elohim. For you loved me while you did not know me and were seeking me in ignorance. But I would not have you doubt that this is truly to be L. When one is able to become small or great as he pleases, for I am able to appear to man in whatever manner I please. Now then, I will begin to unfold to you what is true. Once on a time, I by my power, turning air into water and water again to blood, and solidifying it into flesh, formed a new creature of man, a boy, and produced a much nobler work than Yahuwah the Creator. For he created a man from the earth, but I from air, a far more difficult matter. And again I unmade him and restored him to air, 
but not until I had placed his picture and image in my bedroom, as a proof and memorial of my work. Then we comprehended that he spoke concerning the boy whose inner being, after he had been slain by violence, he made use of for those services that he required. All right, so I, I take that back. We'll read one more so we can get Kefa's ex explanation, and then we'll stop there. And then th this is Simon the Magician, hopelessness of his case. Yet Kepha, hearing these things, said with tears, Greatly do I wonder at the infinite patience of Yahuwah, and on the other hand, at the audacity of man's rashness in some. For what further reason can be found to persuade Shimon that Yahuwah judges the unrighteous, since he persuades himself that he employs the obedience of inner beings for the service of his crimes? But in truth, he is deluded by demons. Yet, although he is sure by these very things that the inner beings are immortal and are judged for the deeds that they have done, and although he thinks that he really sees those things that we believe by belief, though, as I said, he is deluded by demons, yet he thinks that he sees the very substance of the inner being. How will such a man, I say, be brought to confess either that he acts immorally while he occupies such an evil position, or that he is to be judged for those things that he has done? who, knowing the judgment of Yahuwah, despises it, and shows himself an enemy to Yahuwah, and dares to commit such horrid things. And I think this is the, the sad reality that we have to wake up to. Simon the Magician is an extreme example of the adversary's influence. But anyone, knowing what's written, which is the truth, and despising it, turning and being contrary to it, are in open rebellion in exactly the same way. And that's something that we have to learn to, dis to discern and act accordingly. If we are a believer, we, we can't fellowship with someone who's doing that. <clears throat> so it is certain, my brothers, that some oppose the truth and obedience to Yahuwah, not because it appears to them that reason can by no means stand with belief, but because they are either involved in excess of immorality or prevented by their own evils or elated by the swelling of their heart, so that they do not even believe those things that they think they see with their own eyes. And here's the three conditions right here that we can test ourselves with to see how far we fall from his favor in these, in these means as well. Whether we have excess of immorality or we're prevented by our own evils, the things that we have done, or we're elated by pride because it's the humble that accept and receive the truth. All right, I thank you all for your time. And I think we'll stop for comments and questions and wrap it up from there. So everyone have a Shabbat Shalom and a wonderful week ahead. And we will see you next time. Thank you.